Hello, 499 class. I wanted to do a little video on chapter four, but mainly on those documents I shared with you, which are from a series of books called uh, New Ways of Doing Something. These are really old, but they call New Ways of Teaching Reading, New Ways of Teaching Writing, New Ways of Using Drama and Literature and Language Teaching. They're from uh, TESOL series. Um, I can get these to you if you're ever interested. I took, I, I spent a lot of time actually going through and photocopying, cutting out, and trying to make them as easy to send to you as possible. About 12 lessons, reading and writing mainly, is for the purpose. Um, what is chapter four? It talks about affective. And you know the affective refers to that filter which means that if you are comfortable, you are open to learning. And if you're uncomfortable, your filter comes down and you block messages. So the filter is really more of a, of like some kind of a power grid that blocks things. So you wanna be open. And how do you promote openness with students? Well, they talk in here about knowledge about the student's background, uh, trying to, in, use their language and i think this is critical when you have non-english speakers and they don't speak much english try to spend some time in class learning their language uh, so that it becomes something of value that will make them more open because they get to be the expert and talk about their culture and you have to be open to that you're not just handing out worksheets saying we're going to study english don't speak Arabic or don't speak Spanish or whatever. Um, and then, um, so this chapter, and I read it, you know, it, it's kind of a short chapter, it says a lot. Um, but you want to have activity in the room and you want to have students involved in little projects, projects where they're building things, projects where they're cooperating with each other. Um, this it's easy to envision this in classes if you're doing a history class maybe you have the students work on doing a, a wagon train and they go through the whole thing about the Oregon Trail or maybe they um, they build a diorama or I think that's what you call it or some kind of a uh, mural or something that talks about the Civil War or talks about pioneers, or talks about what a plantation was like as opposed to a small farm during the time of slavery versus uh, freedom in states. Um, providing language support is in here, and, and grouping strategies. So you don't want the students that speak limited English and say they speak Urdu and they're from Pakistan, but there's only two of them. You don't want them to spend all their time together in their little tiny group, but you want to, to some extent, split them apart. Um, and you want to involve their parents, ELL students' parents. You want the class to be very warm and inviting so that when they do have difficulty, it doesn't discourage them. So that's what we're talking about with affective. Now, um, it also talks about high expectations and one thing you can you can achieve high expectations if your student is involved in learning as much as possible so they're excited and enthusiastic you do not get high achieve, high achievements in learning when students are filling out documents filling out worksheets and, and basically are required to memorize information that, that is kind of a dead-end approach, leads to an absolutely dismal class. Um, and you don't want it to be teacher-centered, you want it to be student-centered. But more, more and more, you want it to be centered on the subject you're teaching, which is the content of its sheltered class, but also English. And so that's how I kind of summarize this chapter, is that involvement of the student and the teacher, and it gives examples of the teacher correcting the student and having small group conversations or one-on-one -on -one conversations. 
So you don't want to create a class where you control it by everybody responding to you all the time. You got to break it up, have centers. Uh, maybe there's a center over here and you're focusing on um, recognition of syllables and sounds and you have some taped material or videotape material. Uh, or if it's a science class, you have a, a, a center over here on animal cells, a center on plant cells, and then students get to study the, what they look like and the parts of the cells. Um, and then as much as possible, get the family involved. When they say family literacy nights, it means inviting the family in so they participate in some aspect of reading. And one good way to do it is have books in their native language. This may be difficult to do, but you may even have to get it off the internet and make your own little booklets. But if you can have something tangible that the parents can read to their child, even if it's a rare language, then you have something to work with. You may have to tape it. If the parents can't read, you may have to get material that has a videotape or an audio tape that they can use with the, uh, the book. Um, so I, that's what I take away from this chapter. Now I gave you a number of these articles and they, I've got them listed. I don't have them numbered on here. So when I mention one, um, I'm just going, the reason I brought these up is that in this class, TE 499, TESOL, I, we're not teaching just about facts about TESOL in the broad scope of it, but I want to make you aware of resources in the world that are helpful. And these came from the books I just showed you about new ways of doing things. Um, here's one called Prompted Ride Around. And indulge me for a minute, I'm gonna talk about these. Um, it's low intermediate. Uh, students get to write without being corrected. So you give them a chance to just move the pencil or move the pen uh, or type, if they're gonna type. Um, divide students into groups of four. Give each student in one group a piece of paper with a different prompt written on it. Uh, for instance, here, now these can be used with it up to college students if you wanted to, uh, but you'll have to adjust these if you have first graders and won't be able to read it or something. There are many good jobs in my home country. A second prompt for another person would write is, I hope to get a good job someday. I like being in America. America is a very strange place. You could change those completely, but to fit whatever age group or whatever, you know, you have. In, and it says, instruct students to write sentences based on previous sentences. So, um, Give the students five to seven minutes to write and then instruct them to switch. The student is in the middle of a sentence, they stop, and then the other person has to finish the sentence. Each paper is then rotated to the right where the student must read what has been written and try to continue the writing. So they're really group writing, but they're stopping and breaking it off in the middle of a sentence or at the end of a sentence. And then so they're all writing on the same paragraphs. They keep switching off. So it's a little bit of a fun thing, you know, it's different. It's not just sitting there writing on something. You get to play with it. There's some element of play and that's what kids like. And then give them an opportunity. Now you may say, this isn't gonna work for my kids. Well, you have, maybe they're doing a drawing and you switch them and they keep doing the drawing. They try to figure out what they're drawing. This is gonna prompt kids to enjoy themselves, to finish the drawing. It could be math problems. But now, what would be the purpose of this, okay? First of all, it's gonna be interactive. Second, it's going to force them if it's, if they're able to write, and we're doing sentences in particular, students are gonna be able to re have to read and figure out what's going on and, or ask questions and continue, continue the writing. So they're gonna be aware of audience. They're going to be aware of topic. What's this person talking about? So they're gonna be focused on that. It's not gonna be a research paper. It's not gonna be a short story. It's gonna be something created by their neighbor. So I think this is called a write around. Very creative. Another one, wooden characters. Uh, read a literary sec a selection. When it says literary, it could be a children's book, could be something more advanced. 
briefly inform the class of a general theme and plot of the story, mention the characters, and then divide them into secondary or the major character, the antagonist, protagonist. Write these items on the chalkboard. Now, they talk about a thing called Cuisinart rods, which is a form of ESL teaching. I, we don't use it, but it has to do with using uh, rods to represent things. So I'll just say that. Um, you don't have to, you could, you could draw if you want. Uh, it says something about the initial story map or rod map in this case. And then students kind of draw out or form out with these rods parts of the story. Now, don't worry about the rods. If it, you don't understand how that works, you can look it up on what a Cuisinart is. Okay, it's not, cruise, cruise, it's not Cuisinart like mixing food up, like a food blender or something like that. But you have students practice trying to figure out the, the reference of the story and what, what's the storyline here. So instead of rods, you can have them draw, okay? And it could be something simple, like maybe Little Red Robin Hood, Little Red Robin Hood, um, and maybe she's going out in the forest and one kid draws the woods and the big bad wolf is in there and then you show where grandma's house is and grandma's in bed. And uh, I can't remember if grandma ran away or if the big bad wolf ate grandma. You know, all these, uh, all these uh, um, fairy tales, um, um, German fairy tales are actually pretty dark and horrible. You know, giants and people killing grandma. You know, it could be good for a nice uh, Nightmare on Elm Street type deal. Okay, so it's called Wooden Characters. Um, they they create a story and they keep the uh well you can you can look at that one if you don't like that one that's fine here's one giving students authority uh this activity gets students to find out how much you know about a topic by free writing and then you introduce topic an article that'll be handed out in class use the article so you got something they can read uh so they can take sides on an issue that and, and they can know something about it Using their notes, the students can free write on the topic for 30 minutes. So they brainstorm, they come up with different ideas. Obviously, this is for a more advanced class. You could use this with regular classes, by the way. No reason why a lot of these couldn't be used with regular classes. For homework, the students get an article that's related to the topic. The assignment is to read and write a summary of the article. So they have to read, they have to understand, they have to give a, a paraphrase or a rephrasing what's important in the article. So this is good work. This combines reading and writing. And a lot of these do in this particular group because I took it from reading and writing exercise books. And some of them are from more literary types. You can read this example. Just picture it. If people can visualize something, they do better on understanding it. Um, students get a descriptive passage from a text and ask them not to show the paper to anyone so only they see the passage but to read the passage visualize it and draw the scene and then when everybody's finished have each group member show the picture to others who try to guess what part of the book it is now obviously if we're talking children's book it'd be something simpler uh, could be, I mentioned Little Red Riding Hood, could be The Gingerbread Man, um, could be Rapunzel, you know. Um, hopefully we get away from that. We go to the Greek, the Aesop's Fables, if you know those. Uh, Aesop was a Greek guy that told stories kind of like children's stories, only they involved things like a, a dog that was jealous because it saw itself in the water and it thought, oh, there's a dog with a bone just like me, and it's holding a bone in its mouth. So when it starts to bark, it opens its mouth and it loses its bone, its food, falls in the water. So you say, being jealous of someone else is stupid. So the jealous dog loses its food because it thinks it's gonna take it away from the other dog, when in fact, it's looking in itself. Aesop, A. E-S-O-P, you can look up all those stories. 
Um, so we have them draw, and that's kind of interesting. Now here's one called stage play, and I like it because it's talking about role playing. Role playing means you pretend to be someone else or something else. Uh, we'll review a dialogue discussed in a previous lesson. So if you have some kind of literature, could be House on Mango Street, if you ever read that about a young girl growing up in, in a Hispanic part of, I think, California. And she lived on Mango Street and it talks about the changes in town and she was a poor section of town. Um, so they, they write out a script as if, you know, they, it could, heck, you could do it with the Matrix. You could do it with the Terminator. You know, that'd be kind of cool. I, I'd like that, Terminator. Um, write about someone talking and they're afraid of running away from the machines. They're trying to kill all of humanity. So they're talking about when the machines are going to come and what they can do to hide and things like that. So you can adjust this. Now, the movie they and book is... S.E. Hinton's The Outsiders, which is a very popular middle school, high school reading book. It talks about kids growing up in a gang in Tulsa, Oklahoma in the 19, uh, 1950s, I guess, or 60s, somewhere in there. And um, um, there's several popular actors that were young at one time. They were all hot actors, very popular um, in 19. 80s. Uh, Dylan was one of them. I can't think of his last name, first name, but they were very popular, kind of like the Breakfast Club. If you've ever seen that, it was the same group of type actors that were in their early 20s or late teens. And people are crazy about them. You know, they were in all kinds of little sh um, serious movies. Um, so kids actually practice writing a dialogue of the characters. You know, so if there's, it could be the Marvel comics. There's no reason it couldn't be that, you know. It could be Mr., uh, um, Mr. Uh, what is it, Mr. America? Is that what it is? Um, the different characters, um, the kids are into that. It catches their imagination. Marvel comics. I love comic books. So if you want to bring comic books uh, or have the video and show what's going on, um, so that that is a totally different, and the reason I'm doing what I'm doing here is to show you it's not all just lecture and do some papers and write some research papers. It's handling dialogue, stage writing. That's what gets kids excited about literature. It's not reading Charles Dickens all the time, even though that can be good for some people, but it's done in a way that kills every bit of your spirit. Um, maximizing their investment, another one. This is uh, student motivation. And you find out what text the students use. Uh, you're looking for things that they want to read, things they like to read. So you go around, you try to find authentic material with good vocabulary lessons. And you try to find material that I think in this case, uh, well, a little bit of it is about how they get along university. So you may, if it depends, if you've got a group that are actually looking to go to college, then what you want to do is you want to look for material that could be like a freshman college introduction to history or science book. And then you want to help your ESL students uh, be able to anticipate and say, this is what a university textbook is like. Very important to do this as, as juniors and seniors in high school. Because what we're talking about here is not just basic ESL so you can go out and get a job. We're talking English second language so your students can exceed expectations, can be very successful in society, go on to college, or go on to some kind of business where they are very, very interactive. Um, that's why I'm introducing all this stuff. Um, I want you to think, I hate that damn box, think outside the box, but I want you to think, what can you do to your students that will help them to be better prepared for advanced studies? Uh, it could be automobiles. Maybe they're going to go down and learn how to fix cars and how to sell cars and how to read um, manuals on car repair. 
I don't know anything about that. Maybe you do, so you can work on that. Okay, universal questions. This is another one. Students are faced with prepackaged group of texts for their ESL courses. It's to teach them how to do reading comprehension and, and get themselves uh, able to read uh, and understand um, different kinds of material they're going to come in contact with. For instance, on an article, they're going to get an article, some kind of article. What does the author write this article for? What is his argument? What is his main idea? We're talking thesis here. We're talking, that's my argument. What kind of evidence can they cite to support? So it's taking things apart, taking the bigger piece and being able to look into it and say, this is what this guy wants you to believe. This is what the, the our main arguments are. And this is an important skill. Now this may not be in their area of interest, but you do this for kids. You want them to be able to deal with the unknown when they get something they're not normally used to. Maybe they have to learn how to use the dictionary very carefully to find out certain key terms, understand the attitude, the tone of the writer. Uh, interacting with literature via, via student-produced videos. I really like this. You actually uh, can have video of a movie that goes along with the book. The other night I watched The Shining, and you know there is the the book The Shining by Stephen King, and then you have then you have the movie, and I don't know how accurately the movie and the book are together, but you need to make sure that at least overall they kind of fit, and what it means is that you're able to help kids reinforce their understanding of what they're reading by showing them bits of the movie. Pretty cool, I think. Um, you don't want a movie that doesn't follow the book at all or skips over everything, but a good movie would be To Kill a Mockingbird. So you don't want them to redo the movie and to say, I don't need the book because I watched the movie. But you want, to, you want to pick out pieces where there's critical moments in the book, which are also in the movie, where the, where the actor has to there's a script, the actor has to act out, he has to say what he believes. You could do that too. And so you do that with your students. And they have some things here, they got uh, um, some short stories, William Saroyan. Um, these are more literary types. The Accidental Tourist is actually a popular movie from the late 80s, won uh, Academy Awards. Gina Davis is in it, she was from she was in uh, Beetlejuice. She played the dead woman, lived upstairs. Um, but this is a way of using video with the book to help reinforce understanding. It keeps, keeps your head in the game. A lot of kids just say, I'll just watch the movie, but the movie's not accurate. It's too, it doesn't cover a lot of the book material. So you have to kind of balance this out. Playing with narratives. Um, groups make up their own narratives, they write them out. So you make a play or a little bit of a scene about two characters that are in a, in a book. You bring them to life, you role play. Uh, people can read the script. So you make a script. What is script? A script is the directions for what the characters are doing, but also instead of description that a book will have, it'll have the narrative, uh, what they say, and a bit about what they do and where they're standing when they're arguing or something violent happens or interesting. The story game, I got all this on one page, took a little effort, and this allows learners to voice their opinions about a story. Uh, it's geared toward more tactile, kinesthetic, visual students, people get up, move around, and they talk about what is going to happen in the story. And, uh, you know, questions in there. Well, obviously you'd have to read the story and help them prepare some questions like a game board. And you wanna know facts versus opinion versus what we don't know. Sometimes in a story we don't know, you know, what happens. Um, we don't know in the movie, uh, the Silence of the Lambs, if you've ever seen that, 
it, at the original movie was a great ending. We see Hannibal Lecter, the terrible cannibal murderer. He's escaped and he's on this island and he's following this guy and he's planning to kill this guy. And the movie ends as he's walking toward him because Hannibal Lecter has successfully escaped. And now he's out in the world doing his evil things again. So you don't know what's going to happen. So there'd be a question. Is he going to kill the guy or is he going to get caught, etc.? cetera? Um, your turn at the mic. Now, I like this one, the last two in particular, the ones about movies, is that um, – you have students prepare themselves and they become an expert on some part of the of the book or the play or something. So if you have an area where it talks about the Amazon River, somebody reads up and they're an expert on what are the dangers of the Amazon River? You know, maybe the character is going to be going into the river. And then you interview somebody and it's kind of like, what do you what do you think about the character's chances in the river? And you say, well, I think he has very little chance. There's piranha in there, and there are all kinds of snakes, and there's uh, caimans in there, or crocodiles, or alligators, or whatever you want to call. And piranhas would be my favorite. You know, they're the ones that eat your skin, and you become a skeleton in about 10 minutes. Not much left of you if there's enough of them. Hungry little devils, they don't get to eat very often. Um, but anyhow, it has all kinds of questions in there. So, and then finally, the last one, talk back to the movies. Choose an appropriate novel for your class. Introduce the novel, and it has accidental tourist here is the one they're talking about. And that's a fairly safe movie. It's not going to have nudity or anything too wild in it. And then um, students talk about the book versus the movie, because the movie always has to cut out a lot of stuff. No one's going to go to a movie five hours long just because it's accurate. That's actually what happened a long time ago. A man made a movie called McTeague. It was after, um, I forget the name of the writer, but it might have been Sinclair Lewis. who was a muckraker. He wrote about the way people are treated in factories back the turn of the century. I think it was him. If it's not, it, somebody like him. And uh, McTeague is about a man who is evil, and he is an itinerant dentist. In those days, dentists didn't really have shops. A lot of them were just wandering around, and they'd pull your teeth for a few bucks. Wherever there was a chair, they had a few instruments to rip your teeth out with. We'll talk about strange uh, medical treatment, but uh, they didn't have an office, and this guy, McTeague, he's just trying to make money off people. So he pulls teeth for fast bucks, um, gets a few dollars. And at some point, he commits a murder. He marries a woman. He's not loyal. And then his whole, the whole movie's about him just going downhill, being a bad character. And the guy that made the movie made every part of the book into the movie. And it was a silent movie, and it was about seven hours long, which is more than anybody could take. Most people can't sit more than two hours. And silent movies are really tough because all they have is somebody playing music in the background. There's no words, except occasionally they have a few letters on there to tell you, keep you, in, keep you informed about what the story is. But anyhow, this is a movie you can talk back to the movie and give your opinion or act as one of the characters. So you actually, it's like you're part of the movie. I always thought my favorite show is The Walking Dead. Can you imagine if you could pretend you're the sheriff, Andrew Lincoln in The Walking Dead and something happens or um, one of the other characters and people get killed and horrible things happen. And you got this guy, uh, Negan, who's evil and he kills people. What would you say to Negan if he confronted you? Or what would you say to, uh, uh, I think, it, who is it? The, one of the women that's a major leader in the groups. What would you say to them if something happened? Or if you had to persuade them not to do something in the show? So I like this for ESL because it's so compelling. It gets them involved in, in the activity. All right. 
Now, I know this isn't the most easy thing in the world to do, but I do have these. You may have to print your two out so you can read them. Because the way you print it out, you're going to have to flip the screen so you can see them or else turn your head sideways. What I want you to do on the, on the discussion is talk about a couple of these, how you might do something with it. So I'm thinking outside the box here on chapter four. So affective means you have to get the students' interest and you have to get them excited. And you can't give them a worksheet and do that. You have to come up with something that they like. And if they like The Walking Dead, you probably can't use it in public school, but I could see with grass, I could see how some people would find it interesting, like me. But, uh, but still you could use uh, rather, rather conventional books. And you get students a chance, you stimulate them to read, write, listen, and speak, because you want all four skills. And so that's what I'm talking about here. You've got to try something like this and you can always find stuff on the internet that will give you different ideas. So that's what I call teaching and thinking outside of the typical, rather boring work that you may get for students. I hope this has been helpful. Uh, at least my point is that, that I want you to get, get your ESL students interested in something, and if it can have their culture involved in it, even better. Sometimes you have to be careful you don't get something that's um, going to offend somebody, not too risque or not too culturally insensitive. So you have to watch that too, but you know, don't just grind out worksheets and hand them out. It's killing people. They hate it. Thank you very much.